Today's roundtable we feature around court cases with truck and automobile injuries. Those stories and much more coming up on Freight Waves Now. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to today's edition of Freight Waves Now. I'm Kaylee Nix here with Anthony Smith. We made it through the week, Anthony. It was a busy week news-wise. It was a busy week, and I'm sure next week will be much of the same mm -hmm. for quite some time. But it's Friday, and we have a very full show for you today. Coming up, we're going to talk to Alan Adler about, of course, Trevor Melton and the court case. And we also have Eric Coolidge, who will be along with us to speed us up on European labor issues as well. And it's Friday, so that means we have an episode of Economy Lately. But first... Best day of the week. I can't wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but first, we have to go to our top story, which is really two stories of two lessons learned the hard way. And we bring in Clarissa Hawes, our senior editor, here to join us this morning. Clarissa, we're starting off with a very tragic story. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Can you dive into what really kind of went down with this first story and a tragic story of a life loss. Sure. Yes, and these are never the stories that I, I enjoy covering at all. And it, it, you know, is a preventable type of crash where, you know, had the truck driver known the bridge height and, and had measured maybe to see if the excavator that he was hauling would fit under that bridge, um, you know, this could have been prevented. But, you know, in some cases, um, you know, that is an, an option and, and it just happened that, um, that a woman, you know, was driving with her son in the vehicle. They had, he had, she had surprised him with a day at a water park. And, and so, you know, they had had a good day before school started and everything. And, and then, you know, the, they were following behind the, this tractor trailer. Um, and, uh, um, and unfortunately it struck the bridge. And as she tried to avoid um, the, you know, the debris and everything, a, a piece of concrete, you know, impaled her windshield. And unfortunately, she died at the scene. Yeah. But and her son survived. As you mentioned, it, it is a really unfortunate scenario and definitely something that, that is avoidable just by taking those simple pre-check steps before you go. The interesting thing about this is the family is now suing for wrongful death in this, but the driver himself hasn't necessarily been handed down any charges yet because the Colorado Department of Transportation is still in their investigation stages. Has there been any type of indication about what type of charges would possibly be filed in this type of situation? No, and the Colorado Department of Public Safety wouldn't provide, um, you know, any, you know, either way, what was if if they expected charges to be filed or not. They just said that, you know, that he as a, a call, you know, sometimes if it's an out of state, um, you know, towing company that's hauling a piece of equipment, they don't know may, maybe the heights of certain bridges or anything. But this was a a Colorado based. A towing company, and you know, and according to um, the state police, they didn't have the proper pull. They didn't get the proper permits to haul this this excavator. Um, so, but you, you know, the, it, they should have known in Colorado. Well, you know, it, when you haul oversized equipment, that this is one of the things that you have to do. So, you know, they don't know if charges will be brought against the driver. What what? the trucking, the towing company might be facing. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns, but as of yesterday afternoon, they were still um, working to get the, to finish the report and, and, uh, you know, and get it finalized. And Clarissa. But, uh, um, oh, sure. Uh, sorry. W this seems, I'm sorry. It seems like there is, um, this has happened before, but I'm not sure if there's ever been an instance where, a life was actually lost. Are there any instances where this case kind of can take um, note from previous instances of this happening? 
Yes, over the years there, you know, and sometimes it's like where the piece of machinery, like it, it has an arm, you know, or a bucket and it it's not pop you know, properly secured and it, you know, at the wrong time, you know, you know, it, it goes up or, or that it's not tarped correctly. And, and sometimes that causes some shifting and, but, you know, these, you know, there's some famous bridges around the country that, you know, that out of state drivers typically, like there's one in independence, you know, that has a very low bridge height and it's posted. There's, um, you know, signs everywhere and, and they get truck drivers every week that, you know, just, you know, don't know ahead. And, you know, there used to be, you know, an Atlas that would tell you all the, you know, that it was like a, a, a big, that everybody looked forward to every year going through and had all the information that you needed for the, for those routes and, and planning your route. Sometimes, um, you know, that that weighs in as well is that you avoid, um, you know, you plan your route to avoid anything with a low clearance bridge. Uh, and, um, and, you know, some are calling into question if, if he, you know, he or the, the company, you know, had planned the route correctly. So, Clarissa, we talk about, like, does this happen very often? And a story like this actually happened here to us in Chattanooga about three years ago, where there was a driver who was going through the I-24, I-75 split, a major thoroughfare here in Chattanooga that sees hundreds of trucks through it every single hour, honestly. And a driver, you know, the piece of concrete had fallen off into his car. The driver was injured. And they found that it was a result probably of a high-clearance vehicle nicking the underside of the overpass, weakening the structural integrity of it, and just wrong place, wrong time, that concrete fell and hit that driver. But it kind of begs the question of how much inspection, road maintenance, bridge maintenance is being done in situations like this to, because if, if you take like a really hard hit from a heavy piece of machinery, you would assume that it would cause it to break. But should there be more structural integrity in bridges like this to maybe prevent this kind of thing? Absolutely. And that's one of the issues I think that, you know, that trucking companies and truckers and, and motorists say, you know, around the country is that the U.S., you know, has, you know, is deficient in most of its bridges, you know, that they get a D or, you know, I haven't seen the latest report, but, you know, that most need, um, you know, bridges and overpasses and roads need you know, proper maintenance. And in this case, um, the Colorado DOT is, it's going to be a two month project to, to reopen the overpass um, for two lanes, you know, and because of this case and, and in you know, the damage that was caused by the impact of, you know, a tractor trailer, hauling a heavy piece of equipment at going, you know, at 65 miles an hour, and, um, you know, and what damage it, it had on that bridge. And, and yes, all, all across the country, um, there's, a, there's a report that is just, if you look at it, you would never want to drive, you know, on these roads because of the, the maintenance on them. It's definitely a huge issue here within the U.S. when we talk about infrastructure and just the amount of volume that goes through these roads and highways every day. Uh, moving into our next top story, we also have a big update or a little bit of an update from the appellate court uh, in the terms of the ex-Roadrunner CFO. Can you recap that case for us real quick? Sure. And, you know, I've been writing about this case for several years now and, and following it and... Um, you know, Peter Arm Brewster, who was the former CFO of Roadrunner, um, and two of his controllers at the time um, were, you know, indicted on multiple charges um, involving securities and accounting fraud. Um, two of the Roadrunner executives were, um, you know, were found not guilty, while um, you know, Arm Brewster was found guilty on four counts, in, in, including like accounting and security fraud issues, and that he knowingly knew that their, um, you know, quarterly report contained um, misstatements and errors, and and at at the time, and that 
you know, evidence at his trial um, showed that, um, you know, since 2014, that he had been made aware multiple times that there were overinflated um, receivables that were being, you know, that that were uncollectible, that were being included in the um, company's financial report, you know, to make it look, you know, that it was more profitable. And, um, you know, he, a jury found him guilty on four um, of the 11 charges against him that he was indicted on. And then um, he was sentenced in, in December of, you know, for two, two, 24 months in a federal prison plus one year of supervised probation. But he um, had filed an appeal, had initially called for the district judge to review the case saying that, you know, that, that it was, you know, that he was a, a CFO level, that he didn't directly have working day knowledge of all of the financial reports. Um, you know, so, you know, in his top position, he, you know, didn't see the day-to-day -day things, issues, and, and that these were accounting mistakes. They weren't, you know, f fraud, you know, it wasn't outright fraud, but um, the judge in that case ruled that, uh, did dismiss the motion, and then he, he took it to the appellate court in the Seventh Circuit who reviewed the case as well. And um, they sided with the district judge that the jury um, clearly understood, um, you know, and and was, you know, and had, was made a rational decision that that he had knowingly, um, had knowingly um, had, you know, had ignored and um, these misstatements and hadn't corrected the financials, which caused, you know, with shareholder. Um, you know, it two hundred and forty five million dollars in, in damage to shareholders based on them having to say that the financial statements for 2014, 2015 and most of 2016 could not be were not correct and could not be re reused. And so the accounting firm and Roadrunner people had to go back through and there was a significant, like over a $66 million loss, uh, net loss um, in revenue based on what they found during those years. So a significant um, a case, I think, that everybody's been watching, you know, for several years now. I totally get that. And it's interesting to watch and it'll be interesting to watch going forward. Clarissa, thank you for being here this morning, touching on both of these stories as always. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. Right now, we're going to go over to the wall for our first carrot update of the morning. Welcome to The Wall. I'm Thomas Wasson, filling in for Tony Mulvey. Joining me is Donnie Gilbert. This was brought to you by Uptake. Do not forget, Donnie, it looks like we have a little bit of reefer madness going on here. Yeah, well, it's kind of Friday, give an update on a little bit of both of them. But uh, looking at volumes, which is here on Blue for Reefer, uh, I've backed it back all the way to June. Uh, and the reason I did this is because, you know, I saw a pretty big uptick just after the holiday and was kind of curious to kind of lay it out all in front of everybody. And we've seen since, you know, since June, a, a small increase, June, July, August, just kept slowly climbing. We hit the, the Labor Day holiday and then it bounced back up again. Of course, it's come down just a little bit, but it's still at 15, 17. But we've seen a nice little increase over the last uh, three months. Uh, for reefer volumes. And uh, this might slow down just a little bit, but as we get closer to the holidays, uh, it's going to pick back up, you know, especially before Thanksgiving. All the, all the family dinners is going to push a lot of frozen goods out. Uh, and then again, right before Christmas and keep it all the way through the new year. So uh, keep an eye on reefer volumes. Uh, what is disheartening is the rejection rates. Rejection rates uh, have plummeted on reefer and now they've you know here back in june they're around the 10 percent mark and they've come all the way down to 6.7 uh currently today so we've seen a, you know a lot of deterioration price wise in the reefer market which just kind of means a lot of customers aren't uh yes they need their uh goods chilled but it's not a timely manner where they're actually having to rush those goods so they're not going to pay the prices and it's allowed reefer rates to fall as well 
they're not going to be throwing it onto the spot. They're mo you're seeing this migration to contract. We're seeing a rise in contracted volumes, but at the same time, because of the carriers losing their pricing power, our rejection rate is still getting softer than ice cream on a hot summer day. Yep, but next chart here, we can, find, we, we, we can still find some of these markets here. Uh, I've brought up here on the next chart. Uh, it's a heat map. Uh, it's a two-week change. And trying to list those markets that are elevated in the changing, so which you know, kind of you know, pushing because as volumes maybe increase in smaller markets, it tightens up capacity, and you can find those markets and a lot of good ones. Uh, if this chart was brought up here, we would see that you know we have I think Jefferson, Missouri, uh, right here, number one right here, Springfield, Mass. These are the ones that have the biggest the the biggest changes over the past two weeks. Uh, Number three, uh, Lakeland, Florida. Now, of course, Lakeland, Florida, it's in Florida. Those are, Florida's a, a very weak market right now, so nobody wants to go to, to Lakeland, but the price to go to Lakeland should be a, a pretty decent rate, enough to pay your deadhead or that low rate that you're going to get coming out of Florida. Raleigh, North Carolina, Spokane, Washington, Greenville, all these markets have seen a lot of uh, increases in volumes over the past few weeks. So these are some of the ones, you know, St. Louis, Des Moines, uh, Boston, <clears throat> but let's jump in here and I'll show you what's going on uh, in one of the markets here. We're looking at Jefferson City, Missouri. Well, again, like I was saying, uh, the increase you see right through here over the past two weeks in volumes has pushed this green line up, which is our rejection rates. So even though it's 6.7% for the, the uh, total market average in Jefferson, Missouri, it's 17.45%. It's all about the location as well. Understanding the location of Jefferson City you can get away with better rates, being strategic about it. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and you know, if everybody's running to these big markets, that's where everybody else is also running as well. So you, you probably have to get up to these rural markets to find these high rejection rates. Well, that's perfect. That's me a wrap for the first carry update, though. Do not fret, we will be back shortly. But before that, we're gonna toss it over to Sydney Edwards and our look at the headlines. With our top stories, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, the FMCSA is clearing up confusion on how it processes hours of service exemption requests after receiving dozens of requests in the last month. Some of those requests are reason by work hour rules not coinciding with driver sleep patterns, and some are reasoned for emergency deliveries. No matter the reason, all hours of service requests must be published in the Federal Register and undergo a 30-day public comment period. However, the FMCSA might be enforcing this rule's stringent scrutiny without needing to. Now, depending on how the rule is written or interpreted. Now, FedEx stock took a nosedive last night after trading closed as the company withdrew its financial guidance for the rest of the fiscal year, just one week before releasing fiscal 2023 first quarter results. The company said that adjusted earnings per share will come in at $3.44, almost $2 short of analyst estimates. Now, with a big drop in operating income and only a slight gain in revenue, FedEx Express is the bearer of the worst results. Operating income fell to $186 million from $660 million in the fiscal fiscal first quarter last year, and the company blamed poor performance on Asian economic issues and service challenges in Europe, and plans to cut expansion projects and limit Sunday deliveries even further as a result. And Austrian transportation and logistics provider Berger Logistics has required Idaho-based carrier Super T Transport. Berger is partially owned by Red Bull and will use Super T to transport products for Red Bull. Financial terms were not disclosed at this time. Super T operates through the western U.S. with a fleet of 216 power units and is 15 years old. Berger does railroad, ocean, and air transport and operates out of four places in Central Europe. Now you can find these details and so much more happening at FreightWaves.com and on our FreightWaves app. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. After this break, we'll have Alan Adder, Adler with us, and we'll have our social roundabout. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Freight Waves now on this Friday morning. It's time for our first check of the weather where we head back out into the tropical Atlantic checking out Tropical Storm Fiona. We've got new advisories issued, new land interactions about to happen, and the storm honestly still not looking impressive, but let's talk about it anyways. So we've got Fiona, which is spinning out just to the east of Guadalupe and those Lesser Antilles right now. The National Hurricane Center has just issued advisory number eight on Fiona. Right now, they've got sustained winds at 50 miles an hour, so it is not seeing that rapid intensification that is normal of storms that kind of hang out in this warm water area. And it's looking to impact those lesser Antilles now here in the next day or so, with that Puerto Rico looking at having the impacts of that by the end of the, the night tonight and start of tomorrow morning. However, with this, that central circulation is still really dislocated and disjointed from the overall thunderstorms in this storm. So if we flip on that, we can see once again, the circulation of Fiona is well out in front of the thunderstorms around it. So we're not expecting that rapid intensification or that really kind of intense storm that you would typically get from a good looking tropical system. So with this, we're gonna be seeing those winds impact Puerto Rico first before the rain gets there. Same thing with those lesser Antilles, the winds will be an issue, the storm surge will be an issue before the rain and the heavy thunderstorms get there. It'll be interesting to see how Fiona interacts with these islands because it is so disjointed and dislocated right now. Not really sure if the circulation will actually be able to hold over moving over those land masses and get it into that really warm kind of water that's on the north side of the Dominican Republic and Haiti, which would give it once again the chance to strengthen before interacting with the United States. Does look like Fiona is going to take a more westward track, though. It's moving due west right now. And as it continues along that track, we will see the potential for it to kind of just fall apart. So we'll be watching that throughout the next few days. We've also got some more tropical activity going on in the Pacific with our next name storm formed this morning. We'll talk about that coming up later. Right now, though, it's time to dig into a little bit of what's going on through the first week of Trevor Milton's criminal trial. And for that, we've got Alan Adler here with us and Anthony Smith. That's right. Thanks, Kaylee. We are joined now with Alan Adler, the one and only. Alan, there's no shortage of stories to talk about right now, but of course, let's jump in with the first one with Trevor Milton. And of course, good morning. Morning. Morning, Anthony. Uh, yeah, you know what? This is um, this is where we're beginning to find out just what happened over the years at Nicola. You know, we know that the SEC and that the Justice Department got very interested in Nicola in late 2020, started issuing subpoenas and things like that. But now we're finding out as the trial uh, moves into the end of its first week that there was a whistleblower. His name was Paul Lackey. He didn't just blow the whistle with the SEC. He also worked with Hindenburg Research, which is the company, the short seller, really, that published a report that literally led to the end of Trevor Milton's reign at, at Nikola. He was pushed out about 10 days after that report came out. And it also, you know, uh, did exactly what it was intended to do, which was which crushed the stock um, down about 24% in the two days after the report came out. It caused the end of a budding relationship with General Motors. It, it really almost killed the company. And Paul Lackey uh, described his work at Nikola early on. He was a contract engineer, and uh, he worked with Trevor Milton, and he worked on what at the time was a natural gas and uh, uh, electric truck that ultimately became the, the, the fuel cell prototype. What he said, and I thought this was pretty interesting, was that, that even though there's been much made about Nikola and environmental protection and cleaning up the environment, he said in testimony that, that when he brought up this idea of, of uh, climate change, that Milton's response was, I don't give an S about the environment. I just want to make money. That's pretty strong stuff coming out in a trial, but Lackey might not be the ideal witness for the prosecution because under uh, under cross-examination, he says, you know, I did make $600,000 from uh, Hindenburg for information that I gave them. And uh, um, oh, yeah, I am potentially going to get more money from the SEC because whistleblowers can qualify for 10 percent to 30 percent of the uh, uh, of whatever fine is issued against a company. So far, that's only been uh, uh, Nikola itself, which agreed to pay $125 million. But you know, Anthony, you're an economist. Do the math, man. That's a lot of money potentially coming this guy's way. Definitely a lot of money for sure. And Alan, this just sounds so 
shady and it interesting. It almost sounds like an episode of like Succession or something that an HBO <laughs> special needs to be made out of afterwards. But Ellen, I've got to wonder, it, like with, with the Hindenburg report and Lackey's testimony, payments back and forth, it almost kind of feels like a he said, she said situation because a lot of, a lot of what the trial hinges on is the false promises that Trevor Milton was delivering to his investors, right? And is, is there an actual paper trail of financial information that ties him to fraud? Or are we looking at kind of just a back and forth, he said, she said, or is that still yet to be revealed? We've got a long way to go, right? I mean, this is a four or five week trial uh, expected, so a long way to go. But what we think the government is going to push for, and I think they've got a, a, a backup plan, and this is me talking, this isn't anything that's written down anywhere. Um, the government wants to show that uh, Milton's use of social media and podcasts and things like that and business media interviews and so forth, was a pattern of lying to push the stock price higher. That's where the fraud comes in. Um, there's three three counts of the four that relate to this, uh, and we're starting to see in other witnesses uh, concerns within the company about things that he was saying publicly. Um, that's also been uh, introduced, uh, you know, through other witnesses this week. Um, the fourth charge is an interesting one in that it it, it still claims that he was sort of pump and dumping, if you will, um, but he was trying to buy real estate in Utah and use stock options to. Uh, to pay for part of the purchase. And the land seller eventually agreed to that, but then turned around earlier this year and sued him in civil court because the options ended up being worthless. Uh, so the government added that as a criminal uh, charge in the case. And it may be that, um, you know, as we move forward, if depending how this plays out in terms of the use of social media, uh, you know, to to build up the company and to try to raise the stock price. It may be that this other count uh, becomes very important to have in their back pocket um, if, in fact, they want to convict him. Now, it's really interesting, guys, that just yesterday, last evening, the Justice Department uh, changed the rules. Um, has nothing to do with the Milton case directly, but they changed the rules on, on how companies report uh, wrongdoing. In other words, if you have... Uh, paid a fine, for example, uh, for wrongdoing, but didn't have to admit that you did anything wrong, you really can't come back and do that again. Basically, the next time somebody's going to get convicted, there's talk about going after individuals, exactly what we're seeing happen here in the in the uh, Milton trial. Uh, the company uh, thus far, I guess it's always possible, but thus far has not been charged with anything, any wrongdoing. It's all focused on Milton. And, and so this is the kind of thing the government looks like they're going to be doing more and more with other companies uh, going forward. So, Alan, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that Nicola itself hasn't yet been charged with any type of wrongdoing. It's all, it's all focused on the individual. Does the tie-in with Lackey now, knowing that he made money out of Nicola, made money from Hindenburg, and now will potentially make money from the SEC, is there a tie there between Lackey and Nicola that could cause some issues for the company or because they severed their relationship is is are they going to get off scot free well i at that stage nicola was a very young company this was way before the, the charges that were filed back in you know 2015 14 and 15 i think is when they were when lackey worked with them uh, and he was a contract engineer so i'm not even sure that he was a nicola employee i think more than anything, Lackey's testimony and the cross-examination probably doesn't make him, you know, maybe the most credible witness. I mean, he says that he was trying to do the right thing, but he's being very well paid for doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, if I'm a juror, maybe I'm wondering, well, okay, I hear what he's saying, but I also see what he's getting. And and so, you know, maybe it's not uh, as clear cut as, you know, somebody who really did blow the whistle and just was aghast at the wrongdoing. I mean, you know, Lackey says he was. But Lackey also says that it was, uh, you know, kind of a the, the windfall that he got and and the money that he made from Hindenburg and then potentially, you know, from the SEC um, is that's life changing stuff for most people. He he made a comment at one point. Someone, uh, I think, the defense attorney Ken Caruso said, "Well, that's a lot of money." He says, "Well, not in this room. It's not." You know, so so I think I, I think in in the case of of uh, Lackey, you've got to 
you've got to wonder, was this the best play for the government to go with with him either first or to get him in there uh, right now? We've had other witnesses um, from Nicola the, itself, uh, you know, pointing to what will ultimately be some testimony coming from CEO uh, Mark Russell. Um, Russell's not accused of any wrongdoing. Uh, he was very close with Milton. Um, actually, Worthington Industries, from, from which uh, Russell came to join Nicola, purchased one of Milton's old companies. He's going to be grilled on that with Without a doubt, especially by the defense, um, when he takes the stand, we don't know exactly when that's going to be. But I think that'll be another high point to watch for. Obviously, we're not going to do daily coverage of this. We're fortunate that we have a uh, somebody in the courtroom watching for us. So we, we won't be filing daily. But this particular information just seemed to be, you know, worthwhile to be in, in truck tech this week. I think you're right. I think that good little weekly update of, of the trial is a good little wrap around to put a bow on it. Alan, thank you for joining us today. Anything else noteworthy in Truck Tech today? Um, and a number of things. It's a, there's a ton of news in there. We are heading out to uh, Germany tomorrow for the IAA transportation event. Um, this is a massive truck show, a uh, global truck show that hasn't been held in four years. We've got some items in the in the uh, in the newsletter on that today, we'll be writing from there next week, both for the website as well as um, I think you can pretty much guess it's going to be the Deutschland edition next week. <laughs> Alan, never a dull moment. Thanks so much for being on, and we're excited for those updates coming up soon. Thanks, guys. All right, we're going to head on over to Isaiah Buchanan. He's going to look at what is trending on social media this morning. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and in this segment, we'll take a look at what's trending on social media. And all this week, we've been talking about how we need to appreciate our truckers just a little extra this week with it being Truck Driver Appreciation Week. And in this video, CRST, they actually had a couple, of, it looks like what appeared to be a um, Mexican restaurant come to their business and cook food for their drivers. Uh, take a look at this video and see what they did for them. You saw that they had that Kona ice truck there as well. Nothing beats a hot, uh, Kona ice on a hot summer day. So CRST, shout out to you for showing a little bit of love to your employees. And today is, the, we're wrapping up Truck Driver Appreciation Week. That doesn't mean we can't continue to show appreciation for our truck drivers throughout the year because they are one of the most underappreciated and hardest working jobs in the country. So if you see a truck driver, just let them know that you're thankful for what they do and that how they get all the goods that are in our homes to us. Well, I want to switch things up just a little bit. We do have a video. I don't know if many of you have heard of this. There was a Chick-fil-A worker. You know, they always go above and beyond for us. And this one actually helped a woman who was getting carjacked in the parking lot. Take a look at this. And we'll actually have that video for, video for you coming up in our next hit. Right now, we're going to take a quick, quick break, and we'll be right back after the break.
Welcome back, folks, to your second carry update brought to you by Uptake. I'm Thomas Watson. Joining me again is Donnie Gilbert. We have a little bit of Van action going on here. Donnie, what's going on? So Van has reacted almost a little bit opposite of what's been happening in Reefer. Uh, we showed you how Reefer volumes have been picking up for the last two or three months. Well, here I got your uh, Van outbound tender volumes in blue and your Van rejection rates here in yellow. And you look back, this is starting back in March. I'm just going to want to show you the, the great decline from March through mid-April. And then since then, you've kind of seen just a slight downhill in volumes for, for drive-in, which has really upset the drive-in industry. Uh, again, there's no uh, immediate need to move a lot of loads right now, and that really puts a, a hurting on the spot market. Uh, if there's no big issues in running this, this freight, then there's no reason for uh, drivers to be able to run those prices up. So what we see here, we see that volumes have dropped down here, uh, picked up just a little bit after the holiday, but they're slowly dropping back down, but we're at 85.40. So there's still a lot of freight out there in the market, just no big rush on that freight. Uh, rejection rates, this has helped rejection rates to fall to 5.60%. Uh, you know, back in March, they were 18% uh, or higher. Uh, so we've seen a, a big decline in rejection rates as well, which is, again, has put a lot of hurting on what's going on in the spot market. Completely. I mean, we're hearing anecdotally that a lot of uh, spot freight is moving back into contract. You can lock in the rates, you can try to make deals. And so it's fascinating because trying to predict, hearing a lot from analysts too, and like you're saying, we have this gradual decline now mm -hmm. from that huge, huge thing following in March. So it's, a, it's definitely something worth watching because like you said, the drive-in market, carriers have recognized a losing pricing power. Shippers are now getting the pricing power. How are they gonna use that power is gonna be the big conversation moving yeah. forward. A lot of freight sitting in warehouses right now. And there's been a shift to shorter and city hall and short hall runs versus mid hall and uh, the tweener hall. <clears throat> Next chart here. Kind of dive in, WRI here right quick. Um, not a lot's changing right now. We talked about Denver uh, the other day. We see Nashville here popping up here. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's starting to see something get a little bit rolling out of Nashville. It's not above four uh, on the WRI, but uh, as you can see, there's not a lot of change in either direction or across the country. So let's pop in here right quick and see what's going on in the Nashville uh, market. Uh, looking here at the end, you see after the holiday here, volume started to pick back up through the holidays up to 98.99. So a, a good mid-sized market right here, but rejection rates that were down, you know, around 4% have jumped up to 9.49%. So we've got something here where a carrier is out of Nashville rejecting this, this freight out of Nashville, uh, which could put some of, this, some of these volumes over to the spot market. And up around 10%, we start to see a little bit of volatility. Exactly. So there are still opportunities, but like you said, it gets a little bit more difficult. You got to play it by, you know, play it by ear a little better and be flexible. Uh, thank you so much, Donnie. This is going to be our second carrier update, but We'll be back for two more. Hang in there, folks. Uh, going to toss it over next, though, to Kaylee and Anthony for our next guest. All right, guys, thank you for that carrier update. Right now, we're going to welcome our air cargo editor, Eric Kulish, to the show. And Eric, we're going to touch a little bit again back on labor, talking about some issues across the pond in Europe. But before we get there, we've got some breaking news coming out of Boeing with an announcement from their CEO about some plane retirements. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it um, wasn't really an announcement. I had to um, pretty much, you know, tackle him uh, yesterday at a conference in uh, Washington that I was attending at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce at an aerospace summit. He was one of the 
key panelists or speakers uh, did a fireside chat and um, you know some of uh, some of the reporters um, you know found him afterwards and were talking to him but uh, I was able to get some a few minutes individually with him and he he kind of let on that uh, Boeing is looking at a freighter version of the 787 Dreamliner which is an important step because uh, you know Boeing <clears throat> um, doesn't really have a replacement right now in mind for the 767 freighter. And, you know, that's important because in five years or so, that production line is going to have to come to an end, as will the 777 freighter, because uh, there's new international uh, noise and emission rules that go into effect, and you can't use uh, older engines uh, on these planes. So they have to come up with a new something new and by then and so they boeing's already got a 777 freighter uh, redesign of uh, coming um so that's already in in place but there was nothing for that mid-size wide body and there's been speculation you know that there there'll be a 787 we know that's been under consideration as a freighter and also that they might develop a you know from whole cloth a brand new aircraft um you know with a freighter type but yesterday he kind of, you know, tilted towards, you know, the 787 as, as their preference. But obviously no decisions have been made. And uh, so that, that was still a, a big clue as to where they might be heading with that. And, um, and on top of that, he was very, very bullish on the air cargo market going forward. This is definitely big news, Eric. When you look at the 777s or the 767, what does this look like with demand, even though the engines are, you know, have to be kind of updated and they're going to be obsolete, essentially, it sounds like. Is there still a lot of demand for these? Oh, absolutely. These are very popular planes. Uh, you know, they're, they're being snapped up or orders are being placed for them, you know, uh, well into the future. So I'm sure Boeing will sell them right up until the deadline um, because they'll be grandfathered in. And they're, you know, they're very popular with express carriers like FedEx and UPS and DHL and all the other cargo airlines that, you know, are out, do outsourced work for the express networks. So they're, they kind of hit that sweet spot in, in long haul and regional flight capability. They're not too big, but they've got, um, they've got a lot of volumetric capacity and, and can, you know, handle a lot of routes that are either international or regional. I want to touch on his thoughts on that air cargo market as well, because as you mentioned, it's it's pretty bullish and expecting it to continue to stay bullish even after the pandemic demand really continues to drop off the cliff, frankly. Are we talking about seeing this demand really kind of put more stress on the air cargo industry as a whole, or are they expecting that deliveries of more freighters will, will kind of alleviate some of that stress and some of that capacity tightness? Yeah, I mean, I think over time, you know, everything's starting to, to normalize. And, and that's what he basically said, that the, the markets, um, you know, obviously coming down from the pandemic, which was an outlier and, and you know, record levels of, of freight volumes. And then at the same time, you had all the passenger networks, you know, off the grid because no one was flying. So that really created a supply crunch. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, freighter conversions um, to, to help bring in some more capacity and then demand's going down. But he basically said, look, even if, uh, you know, co once COVID's over and demand normalizes, it'll still be as good or better than 2019 going forward. You know, he was very bullish. He said, you know, growth is, it's just air cargo's trending upwards people need you know there's e-commerce when people need something fast it's you know air is the only option and you know a few months ago boeing put out its forecast for about 4.1 percent compound annual growth of air so you know it's it's slow and not even that slow but you know steady as she goes growth and he and the interesting thing was he said he doesn't see air cargo giving back any share or any any ground to other modes like you know ocean or rail so Well, Eric. Oh man, I thought we had Eric there for a second. Looks like it looks like we just lost him. Anthony, we were going to talk to him a little bit about some of the labor issues going on across the pond in Europe, as I mentioned. I want to get your thoughts on that. We're seeing folks strike in UK at the airports, at the ports there as well. Seeing strikes going on in some of those um, dock workers with some of those unions over there demanding big increase in wages. How do you think that this kind of plays out with European economics versus American economics, both debating labor issues? 
For sure. So I think when we look at Europe, we have a much more, I think, sensitive situation going on there just because of what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. Mm. And so we're a little bit insulated, but not very insulated from that because it's like the transit of property is going to affect Europe, so it's going to affect us eventually. So I think their labor issues are going to be much more impactful right now just because they have such a sensitive situation happening on the eastern front of them. And so I think as we look at that, it, it, it definitely gonna make things a lot more sensitive. Right, and we know that Europe, the government in Europe typically favors their workers a little bit more than the American government does. Historically, they've been a little bit more pro-worker side, pro-labor side. What do you think about that? I, I, well, I was gonna ask you about that one because we had <laughs> conversations about you know different aspects of unions mm -hmm. and um, you, get, you brought up some great points about what they're there for and what some of the great use points of them are. And it sounds like you make a, a great point there is that Typically, we see that there are a lot more protections and um, I, I think availability for, oh, do we hear Eric? Is, is he back? Here? Is he back? I don't know, not yet. We got it. Okay. Eric We're working on him. There we go, okay, he's back. we have Eric back. <laughs> Eric, thanks for joining us uh, once again. Yeah, sure, no problem. Can you hear me? We got you good now. We were just starting to talk about what's going on in Europe with their labor negotiations and kind of how that coincides with what's going on here in America. Give us just a pretty quick rundown about what we're seeing there with workers deciding to strike, what they're striking over, and what their demands are. Right. So, as you know, it's been big news here. The freight railroads were up against the gun or the deadline uh, with, uh, with unions uh, preparing to strike. Well, that seems to be averted. But, you know, these, these labor actions and, uh, you know, emboldened uh, freight transportation workers, um, you know, um, are happening around the world. So you've got, you had some near strikes in Germany that I think were averted at some of the ports there. But, um, in, in the UK at the Port of Felixstowe, which is a major container port, and the Port of Liverpool. Some strikes, eight-day strikes are scheduled in the next week or so. Uh, you have uh, air traffic controllers in France today going off the, walking off the job for a one-day walkout. And, of course, you still have the ILWU, the dock workers on the U.S. West Coast, waiting uh, or negotiating and for a long-term contract. That's still up in the air. There's been no progress, and so people are worried, you know, could, could we see work slowdowns or other actions there? So, so far, so good, but these things are just ha cropping up all over. And Eric, with this, sounds like it's just a one-day thing, is that right? Or would this be a multiple-day thing or potentially something that could reoccur a little bit later on if terms aren't met? Yeah, the, the, the action in France is a one-day um, air traffic control thing. Um, so the, the authorities asked the airlines to cut back their schedules by 50%. And, but, you know, there could be another strike down the road. Lufthansa had some similar issues. Their ground In July, their ground staff went off one day. The pilots were about to go off for one or two days. Um, but that got averted with a last minute deal. So I guess Europe's a little different. They don't, uh, they, they do it in little increments and build up. Whereas in the U S you know, once we strike, that's it until we're, we're done with our talk. So, uh, kind of a little different approach. All right, Eric, thank you for jumping back on after we lost there for a second. Great to talk to you as always. We'll catch up with you again next week. I'm sure. All right. Have a good weekend. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with more Freight Waves Now. I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now.
Welcome back to Freight Waves Now on this Friday. It's time for our second check of the weather. And headed into the weekend, we're looking at a pretty quiet last weekend of summer for the majority of us here. There's a couple places where we could see some pop-up thunderstorms today ahead of our next fall cold front. But with that, most of the country is staying nice and quiet and kind of chill for this last weekend of summer. Let's check it out and start our critical events right now. Eastern half of the United States is still being dominated by some high pressure just sitting over really all of us here in the southeast. That's kept clouds, rain, and those warmer temperatures well off the coast, making it feel pretty great for the entire southeastern parts of the country. Up to the west, though, the northwest, we've got our next low pressure system that's kind of spinning right now over central Minnesota. And with that, we can see trailing off of that center of low pressure, we've got those line of thunderstorms developing. We're going to be watching for two pieces of development here today. Right out in front of that line, we're going to be seeing the chance for some thunderstorms to pop up. This is our day three severe weather outlook, so there's a couple days there. Behind that, this is going to be the place where we see that development today. And with that, we've got kind of this dry slot where you've got a little bit of moisture being fed in. You've got some forcing from these um, southerly winds moving here out of Wyoming and Montana. That'll provide just enough of an environment to see those thunderstorms pop up. Severe threats for this, once again, will be those strong winds, some big hail is what we typically get with these early fall thunderstorms. Potential for a tornado or two, of course, can't be ruled out, but it shouldn't necessarily be a widespread tornado outbreak. Same thing with our day three outlook. This one expected to spread a little bit more and be a little bit wider by the time that that severe weather actually happens on a Sunday. And we're gonna keep an eye on that as well. Other than that, desert Southwest California into Texas, Oklahoma, going to be staying a little bit on the warmer side for this last weekend of summer, but still pretty clear and pretty calm overall as far as your storm activity goes. We'll talk a little bit more about some colder weather dropping into the front range, maybe some snow headed to some of those mountains, a little bit more in our next weather update. But right now we're going back over to Isaiah Buchanan. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and like Kaylee said, we take a look at what's trending on social media. Well, this week has been Truck Driver Appreciation Week, and a lot of companies have been doing things to show just a little extra love to their truck drivers. Take a look at what CRC CRST did earlier this week. Mexican food and a Kona ice machine on a hot summer day doesn't sound too shabby to me. Well, although Truck Driver Appreciation Week is coming to an end, that doesn't mean that we can't stop showing our appreciation to truck drivers. We should be showing them appreciation throughout the year because they are very underappreciated and work very hard to make sure that we have all of the goods that are in our home. So if you see a truck driver out, just show them a little love. Well, switching gears just a little bit, we know that Chick-fil-A employees go above and beyond. I mean, it's the best fast food service that you can get by far. I mean, they get you through the line, they take care of you, get you your food. The order is always right, and they even help with your safety. Take, take a look at what happened in a Chick-fil-A parking lot earlier this week. So a little bit of backstory as to what happened here. A woman was in the parking lot getting her child out of the back seat when a man tried to come up and carjack her. And one of the Chick-fil-A employees saw this and ran over to help. He started wrestling with the man. And all I can think about is, sir, it's my pleasure to put you in this headlock real quick. Well, the man ended up getting arrested for carjacking with a battery, and he has been arrested in that Chick-fil-A employee. Big shout out to you, man. Keep doing up, keep up the good work and keeping your employee or your uh, customers fed and protected. That's all I have for this edition of Social Roundabout. But right now we're gonna take a look at the last 24 hours in freight with our market update.
is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app. Welcome back, folks. I'm Thomas Watson. Joining me is Donnie Gilbert. This was brought to you by Uptake. We're in the third quarter of our carrier update, also in the third quarter of the year, by the way, but have a little bit of, uh, what data are we looking at today? What's on the menu? Yeah, well, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, Nashville here as we finished up last time. Uh, just to kind of reiterate, you know, a big bump there in rejection rates. Volumes are, are hopping back up there as well. So you might want to go into your market dashboard. If you have lanes that are running in the Nashville, maybe check the market dashboard and see what those spot rates look like on um, getting your truck back for the Nashville market. Maybe it might look a little bit better than other areas of the uh, that you're being offered right now. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and jump forward to the next chart, though. And looking at the NTI, both the D and the NTI, so the seven-day roll on average and the actual. Uh, here we have the uh, seven-day roll on average in blue. It did drop down just one more cent here, kind of what was expected. Uh, and, of course, the, the actual bumped up a penny. But what it is is what we're seeing here, you know, this – volatility that we're seeing where they're really jumping up and jumping down. We're going to see that kind of shrink down some as the markets deteriorate. Are we going to go a lot lower than 2.68? Hopefully not. Uh, we're pretty close to actual 2019. Adjusted for inflation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we really don't want to go down much further than this because it's going to, this right here is going to tighten the strains on a lot of companies already. And we're going to see uh, these guys that bought the newer trucks, the newer equipment, start to go out of business here probably over the next six months. Exactly. It's, it's going to be pretty disappointing. I hate to see that. Um, but, we you know, as we look back, though, you, you, you can see, like I say, in between the, the highs and the lows here, you'll see those drop down as this volatility leaves and we kind of get closer to what we're going to be running over the next few months. Nothing exciting coming up until probably about mid-October. 
I think that's what's so fascinating, especially with the NTI and the NTID, the daily part. A lot of people compare brokers to day traders. It's almost like a high frequency game. Do I quote high? Do I quote low? High or low? And so, you know, we can really see this kind of opportunity where when we're talking about the declines and we're thinking, oh man, well, there's nothing I can do. Well, you can still capitalize on the difference. But like you said, as we're moving into later in the year, that delta, that difference, the spread is going to contract and make it to where, uh, you know, then you have to rely on your purchasing power. Yeah. <clears throat> Next chart here, right quick, we're going to jump in. Diesel fuel. We do see some exciting things finally in the diesel fuel market. Here in blue, I have the uh, DTS, uh, the actual truck stop average rates that they're selling at the pump. And in red here, I have the wholesale price, ultra low sulfur reduced to the rack price. Well, Overnight here, we saw about a 20 cent drop in the rack price. Now, Tony and I discussed this a lot about that area that 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 the um, retailers are comfortable having that spread of you know 95 cents to a dollar 15, dollar 20, which would allow retail prices to go down. Well, this spread now has jumped to like a dollar 47. So here we've been looking at a half a cent per day drop. You know, back here when we saw it dropping in July, we we're looking at a penny per day. Now we're looking at a half a cent. Hopefully we'll see this pick up because we saw this big drop in the rack price. Perfect. We'll definitely keep an eye on that, especially energy prices are such a big factor impacting carriers as well. But that's going to be it for this segment. And we're going to toss it back over to Kaylee and Anthony for our next one. Hi right, guys, thank you for that carrier update. We will have one more before we're done here for the day. Right now, we're going to welcome Ann Ranke to the show, ahead of the TIA, with some exciting stuff going on with you guys. Ann, thank you for being here. Let's talk a little bit about a policy fly-in and what you guys are doing to kind of keep working hard. Sure. So, uh, and thanks as always for having me. I always enjoy talking to you both. Um, so this is a phenomenon of Washington where various groups come in to meet with members of Congress from the committees of jurisdiction and talk about what their core priorities are. So in effect, it's like grassroots lobbying because you bring in people who don't typically come to Washington. And we find that to be more effective because those folks actually uh, run businesses and know what they're talking about instead of the folks in D who may just sort of tangentially know the issues. So it's always helpful to have people who are constituents, who run the businesses and can talk knowledgeably about the issues. So we have three issues this year, and all of which I think we've talked about on this program before. The first, of course, is AB5. We obviously are very concerned about that becoming either federal law or spreading to the various states. So we think that for now, what they call the PRO Act will not pass. They just don't have the numbers in the Senate. Uh, and while the filibuster exists, we, we think that we're not going to see a PRO Act get enacted. But obviously, um, that's something we have to pay attention to. There are various people and wanting to call for the end of the filibuster. And what couldn't happen legislatively could happen through regulation, and the Biden administration has signaled its interest in changing the independent contractor law. So that's issue number one. The other two issues are things that we talk about all the time in, in the context of brokerage. One is we um, are wanting to have a more robust enforcement for illegal brokering. I think you and I have talked about how there are 80,000 pending complaints at the consumer complaint database run by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. None of them have been ever acted upon or any uh, penalties dished out. So if we have a law which defines a broker and yet we don't actually enforce it when it is broken, what is the point? It's sort of a toothless tiger. So we are calling for stepped up enforcement um, and, and more robust consumer complaint database. And then the last thing is we want to make sure that we can modernize along with, um, with the industry itself. So we're calling for some modernization of the law. The, the brokerage industry is very different than it was back in the, in the 80s. You may have seen our rebranding. It's similar to sort of what you say is we're the center of the supply chain. We are bigger than we used to be. And so we're calling for the laws to keep up with that. And, and I think that definitely makes sense as this industry continues to grow that that needs to step up as well and keep up with the times. Going back to the first one with AB5, we're gonna be some of the main points that are gonna really be pushed here because it seems like it definitely has some interest in going at a federal level, which I think would 
definitely shift and cause a lot of, I think, turmoil for a lot of potential or current owner operators or independent contractors. Yeah, you're exactly right. So, you know, the the owner operators are the ones who are going to be the most greatly affected, obviously, but a lot of the people that we interact with that we hire to do to move our customers on the other side's freight are owner operators. Mm -hmm. So what is that going to do with our relationship with them? And as you all know, the capacity, while it's eased some, the crisis is not as bad as it was a year ago, there's still not enough capacity. So if we have a whole cadre of owner operators who are not able to operate because they don't want to or because they can't in California, what does that do with the overall capacity crisis? So that's one of our our primary concerns. The second is capacity writ large. What is that going to do? So our relationship with owner operators, the capacity crisis. And finally, we employ freight agents, which are typically independent contractors. And so we have some in the state of California. We think that because they are part of a business, that there should be a business to business exemption. As you know, the California law provides for some exemptions for different businesses but we're not sure. So we want to get all the I's dotted and T's crossed because, you know, nobody knows how this law is going to be enforced, right? It's It hasn't been. It's finally will be. We just don't know what that looks like. Absolutely. And we know that kind of the acting administration almost has... I would almost kind of say a vested interest in this, kind of saying, you know, we don't necessarily want to fully impose a federal law, but we would look at that as a very serious option. Do we see the fight that's going on in California right now and the kind of the response that we've seen from the grassroots efforts of the drivers there, and the businesses there in California, do we see that having any weight in a federal decision or it just being kind of off the sides right now? Yeah, I mean, Kaylee, it's a great point because the, there were some protests initially once the Supreme Court denied cert, but they didn't last too long, right? And there wasn't enough threat of interruption of business to, I think, have too much of an impact. So unfortunately, I think people who are in favor of changing the independent contractor law were not dissuaded by those protests that we saw. They still want to replicate. And there are a couple states, you know, New Jersey is looking at it, the state of New York is looking at it, Illinois is looking at it. So what starts in California doesn't end in California. And, and when we're looking at AB5 and the timing of it now, do you see that now is a bit more of an advantageous time for something like this to go through as we kind of start to see some of the supply chain crises really ease with capacity? Or do you think this would still be up for a debate or even an option if we were still in the midst of supply chain pandemonium like we were, uh, you know, about a year or so ago? Gosh, Anthony, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, sure. The timing, as we talked about, the capacity is is has eased. There's not as much demand as there was. So in a sense, we do have the luxury to, to implement a really bad law, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we should. And certainly we need to continue to fight uh, on the federal level because, you know, California does a lot of things that make their business environment incredibly challenging to operate in. We should not try to do that nationwide. You know, we had a perfect storm over the last two years. We're back where the weather is a little bit more moderated. Do we really want to ramp up to another perfect storm again? It, it, our country can't take it. I mean, thank God we didn't have a rail strike today and, and that they were able to reach a tentative agreement. But any kind of dislocation like a rail strike or some sort of other bad law that affects how people do their business it's going to make the supply chain crack wide open again. And I want to touch on one last thing before we let you go today. The midterm elections and the timing about this, this policy fly-in, and as we're sitting about six weeks now for midterm elections, we do have some candidates who are running within their state and even within their own district that are very, very vocal against laws like AB5. What type of, I guess, kind of influence do they have or, or what type of influence are you guys hoping to have on new legislators who would come right yeah. after this policy fly in? Well, so new legislators don't have much influence at all because they're like way in the back bench and they're freshmen and, and all of that. But they do have a bully pulpit and that helps. 
um, because now everyone has their own Twitter account and everything else. And so, so yes, they do have a voice. And so it's incumbent on us to go out and meet those folks. We've actually been able to meet some of the candidates that you alluded to just to see who they are, talk about our issues. All we can do is educate, right, and make them understand exactly what we stand for and who we are and what their businesses are in their state. And that's what we will continue to do. Otherwise, we're doing our membership a disservice. You know, there's so many people out there who are up on Capitol Hill talking about their issues. We have to be out there, too. And God bless those members of Congress, both new and incumbents. They have to know a lot of different issues and they cannot be expected to specialize in ours. So we better be up there educating. Exactly right. And I couldn't imagine trying to like learn all the different mm -hmm. issues really kind of it give me a headache thinking about it. But Anne, thanks so much for joining us this morning. <laughs> we appreciate you being here. Thanks to you guys. I appreciate it. Have a great day. All right, and have a great weekend as well. All right now we're gonna head back over to Sydney Edwards. She's got a full look at our top stories this morning. Getting into a full report of our headlines for the day, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, FedEx stock took a nosedive last night after trading closed as the company withdrew its financial guidance for the rest of the fiscal year, just one week before releasing fiscal 2023 first quarter results. The company said that adjusted earnings per share will come in at $3.44, almost $2 short of analyst estimates. With a big drop on operating income and only a slight gain in revenue, FedEx Express is the bearer of the worst results. Operating income fell to one. 186 million from 660 million in the fiscal first quarter last year. The company blamed poor performance on Asian economic issues and service challenges in Europe and plans to cut expansion projects and limit Sunday deliveries even further as a result. Austrian transportation and logistics provider Berger Logistics has acquired Idaho-based carrier Super T Transport. Berger is partially owned by Red Bull and will use Super T to transport products for Red Bull. Financial terms were not disclosed at this time. Super T operates through the western U.S. with a fleet of 216 power units and is 15 years old. Berger does railroad, ocean, and air transport and operates out of four places in Central Europe. And container imports at the Port of Los Angeles continue to fall, even as U.S. container imports as a whole stay elevated. The Port of L.A. reported a total throughput of 805,672 TEUs in August, a 15.5% year-over-year decline. Imports were also down 16.8% year-over-year and 16.7% compared to July. This is the lowest import total for the port since December, where congestion was to blame for the numbers and the lowest number for August since 2014. However, this does not sit with the nationwide trend of imports being high. Savannah's August imports were up 20% year over year for the same period. And diesel futures have made a significant downturn in the past few days as demand in the U.S. weakens, raising inventories. Ultra-low sulfur diesel on the CME Commodity Exchange settled at $3.20 a gallon yesterday, down 17.37 cents from Wednesday, which was also had a drop of 16.24 cents. Futures prices are dropping much quicker than declines in the value of crude oil, which has risen to $94.10 a barrel. Wholesale diesel prices have dropped as well down almost 20 cents just yesterday. And CSX will have a new president and CEO by the end of the month as automotive executive Joseph Heinrichs takes over starting September 26th. Current CEO Jim Foote is retiring but will remain on with the railroad as an advisor until March 31st to help with the transition. Heinrichs has served as president and of Ford Motor Company, handling its global operations and the Ford Lincoln brands. He said that he has plans to spend time with labor leaders in the railroad to get to know their issues and hopefully find some middle ground with labor negotiations. Now you can find these details to stories and so much more happening at FreightWaves.com and on our FreightWaves app. And if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. We're going to hand this over now to Kaylee Nix with the check of our weather. Thanks, Cindy, for those updates. Moving now into our next weather update. Right now we're talking about going into the last final weekend of summer. Um, fall officially starts on September 21st, so that's going to be next week. 
But for some folks, they're already starting to see maybe just a little bit of a hint of winter. So let's check this out, this video out right now from Copper Mountain. This is the view on Copper Mountain in Colorado yesterday. You can see they're getting that first dusting of snow up there. Lots of the high elevations in that Colorado Front Range got their first snow of the season yesterday. Just enough to kind of dust and coat the ground, not, a, not enough to be an actual accumulating amount. But we will see the potential for a little bit more accumulation, especially in those highest elevations today and into tomorrow as that cold air and that moisture kind of events to see what's going on. We've got both the radar and the satellite presentation on right now. An area of low pressure with some cooler air dropping south out of Canada into the mountains of Wyoming and Colorado right now. Heaviest precipitation is moving through just north of the I-70 corridor, moving out of uh, Utah into Colorado. Temperatures there in the low is going to get down into the tonight. So some of this rain could be frozen on some of those elevated surfaces, but we're expecting more snowfall in those higher um, elevations. Same thing up into Wyoming, just outside of Jackson, outside of Yellowstone National Park. Some of this rain that's falling in the lower elevations is just rain. Those higher elevations looking at some snow potential here for today into tomorrow. That first official snow for these folks, it's going to feel good knowing that fall is just a couple days away and getting to get some of that warmer air out, some of that cooler air in. Hopefully we see a good snow year this year. So far they've seen a pretty wet summer, so that should coincide with a little bit of a wet winter as well. Time to replenish some of those snowfall basins, replenish some of those reservoirs as well from that snow melt. We're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be right back with more Freight Waves now in just a few minutes. Freight Waves is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app. This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet, built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We are welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience. Oh, and we're online. Where am I? Android South 12.4, you're exactly where you need to be. And we're going to start activating Project Sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to The Kind Lady. I'm Anthony Smith, Chief Economist here at Freight Waves, and this is episode 17, and I'm joined by the one and only South Turk. Yes, Anthony. Nice to be here. It's great, man. We got to hit the streets last week. We got to see what's going on in this universe. Seems like a lot of the same, but I have a good feeling about this place. Yes, me too. This is great. I remember all of that. Why are you talking like that? What's up that accent? Talking like what? It's like a British accent you're doing there. This is not British. What are you talking about? How do you know Brave exists in this universe if you're so new to it? Mm -hmm. You're doing some kind of strange accent. I don't know what's going on. And, and what's up with that ridiculous mustache? What mustache, Anthony? You have a ridiculous mustache. Also, you haven't blinked in the last like, 17 minutes. And when you did, you like closed one eye before the other. Mm -hmm. And it was very pronounced and strange. Why don't you focus on the economy, Anthony, and not my blinking? Mm hmm? Something weird going on south, and I don't know what it is, but I don't care enough right now. I'm going to figure it out, though. CPI, or Consumer Price Index, and people were shook at this release. When we look at it, it was up 0.1%. And you might be thinking to yourself, 
We've been dealing with this CPI or inflation thing for a while. 0.1% doesn't seem like a lot, but like last month's CPI, we got to dive into the details and this is even more pronounced than it was then. So last month we saw a 0% movement, which was flat and people took as a good sign because inflation wasn't getting worse. And we said that, hey, this was a lot due to energy prices coming down, but a lot of the other segments came up or remained very much elevated. The story was the same this month again. So we looked at the CPI, we saw that energy prices came down 5%, but the other subcomponents remained elevated or even increased in most instances. So that's showing that the consumer price index is still very much active and still very much elevated, showing that there's still inflationary pressures. We look at different components within the CPI, we see that there was indeed an increase that was for food, which was up 0.8%, that's essential, shelter up 0.7%, and apparel up 0.2%. So these are all things that are going to contribute to, of course, the cost of living. And when we look at this, it's all going to be factoring into consumers' abilities to spend and buy goods and services outside of those essential goods. This is going to be a problem, especially when we look at freight activity. But when we look at what this all means for where we're going in the future, especially from the government standpoint, the Fed is likely going to use this as fuel for continuing to raise interest rates. Federal Chair Jerome Powell is looking to be tough on inflation. and He's looking to channel his inner Paul Volcker to challenge this inflation fight and be hawkish and hard on inflation and is saying that there's likely going to be some pain around this. And... We'll see about that. We'll see how aggressive he's going to continue to be in the face of inflation as some of the other macro indicators may be continuing to show some signs of weakening, especially with unemployment really starting to start to show some cracks, even though we are starting to see some tick up in the participation rate ever so slightly, and we're starting to see some initial jobs claims come down. This is also going to be a strong driving factor for Federal Chair Jerome Powell to start to continue to increase interest rates moving forward. Now, continuing around those interest rates is going to have significant implications for business conditions. And speaking of business conditions, we have to talk about industrial production. So we're seeing in manufacturing that there's been a lot of pull forward happening. And this has just been a lot of just in case scenario instead of actual just in time or needed inventory. And it's going to be concerning as we continue to move throughout the remainder of this year to see how needed some of this inventory is, especially upstream. Now, this is also going to have implications for freight, especially when we look at the flatbed trailers and of course, South Bochum. Oh no, not the Fotri. Nothing but the Fotri. Is it a Scottish accent that you're doing? Jamaican? No, Anthony. I get the two confused. No accent. I do not do accents. I don't know what it is, but I'll, I'll figure it out. There's something going on here. But manufacturing, there's a lot of interesting trends going on there. And we're going to get a little bit more of a clear review as we dive into that industrial production report that gets updated this week. And we'll dive into the details again next week's update around the economy lately. Another update that's going to be happening this week before the time of this recording is going to be retail sales. Last month's update showed a flat trend of 0%. A lot of that came down to, of course, like the CPI, gas prices. So gas prices in the CPI came down, as I mentioned earlier, 10.6% thereabouts for gasoline specifically. Retail sales for gas stations also came down pretty substantially in the last update for the retail sales update. And that really was the main driving point for reducing overall retail sales. Should it also be noted that retail sales, the headline number is not adjusted for inflation, but a lot of the same is likely going to happen this upcoming report, We're likely going to see some easing once again for gas station prices and things like that for retail sales at gas stations. But other segments and other components of the retail sales report will likely show some increases. And of course, it's not adjusted for inflation. So if you were to by chance see any kind of positivity in any chance, you can think inflation. If we see any downward movement, it's because we saw some downward movement in gas prices, most likely, and that other components of the retail sales report is likely going to remain somewhat elevated. But if that's not the case, of course, we're going to jump into that report again next week to dive into some of those intricate trends. And of course, we have to get into honorable mentions and updates for the upcoming week. So honorable mentions, initial jobs claims. The report before this recording had it at 222,000. 
there's jobs claims. So that's a downward movement and it's great news. I would love to see it continue to stay low and at a subdued level. I want to see fewer people filing for an initial jobs claims unemployment benefits. It seems like a mouthful south, but I want to see more people being employed and not having to file for benefits like that. So that's going to be something that we watch closely. I'm still not completely sold on it at all whatsoever. With previous reports, we've seen that hiring has slowed down. We're seeing that the quit rate is starting to ease up a little bit, so consumers may be not feeling as confident. So I'm going to be diving into all those trends as they continue to get updated and released. We also have updates, of course, coming from Jerome Powell. We'll see how hawkish he remains to stay on these interest rates, and I'm sure he's going to have a lot to say in the upcoming week, and I'm sure the markets will react rationally. I'm, I'm so sure. We also have updates around... Housing starts south. It's going to be another faux try. Oh no, no, not faux try. No. Is this like a Dutch accent? Yes. Like the Netherlands or something? Uh huh. German? It's exactly that. Yes. Uh huh. You are correct, Anthony. Smart. You are so smart. Nothing to worry about. Scandinavian. I can't place my. If something's. Anyway, so we're going to have a lot more updates coming up in the upcoming week, and I'll be here. South, I'm sure you'll be here as well. No, we will both be here, Anthony. Why will we not be here, huh? We'll see you next episode. Wish me luck. This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet, built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We are welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience. Welcome back, folks. I'm Thomas Watson, joined by Donnie Gilbert. This is brought to you by Uptake. It's Friday. Get excited for all you brokers out there slumming it up. We have some data for you to help with that. Donnie, what are we looking at? Yeah, so here, you know, we, we always try to end it up, end it with, you know, some lanes of the day. Try, try to dig through and find some lanes, at least 
paying 250 or averaging 250, 275, three dollars a mile plus. So today we're going first up in here. We're going to do a reefer lane first off the bat here, and we're looking at Chicago headed down to Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, pretty good rate here. I got our NTI turned on here in white. It's at 268, so I like to compare everything to our NTI, but we're running at 368, a good dollar a mile over the NTI, uh, and a pretty good lane at 534 miles. That's going to take you all day, so a good one day run from Chicago down to Memphis. But what's it going to be from Memphis back to Chicago? Uh -oh. So hit our little double arrows there and see how we can reverse this lane and look at Memphis headed back to Chicago. But, you know, I, I like using our, our, um, our uh, market dashboard here, you know, for <clears throat> if you're a carrier of where to place your trucks, you, you know, normally you have a contract and you have a lot of destinations. Which ones do you choose? Well, if you're actually in Memphis, you might want to look at this lane right here. If, if, if you have the ability to deliver into, into Chicago, so now you can see what your, your rate is going to be back. So let's swap this over here and try to get Memphis back to Chicago here. And it's paying still 309. So here, not a bad rate at all. Around about $3.38, 39 per mile round trip. So a pretty strong rate for reefer here. Again, still um, you know, almost 40 cents above our NTI. <clears throat> Next lane here. Bounce in, look at Allentown to Boston. Of course, if you're going up into the Northeast, you know that you're going to be getting paid. It's a place that really a lot of people do not want to go. Some of the highest rates per mile, but it's also shorter miles. You're only looking at 300 miles. 300 miles in the Northeast is probably going to take you all day anyways. So uh, heading up there, you're looking at $4.56 $4 uh, rate per mile average headed up from uh, PA to Boston right now. Uh, there's mediocre uh, volatility in this you're looking at between 425 and 494. Uh, hit the little little double arrows button search the lane again to find out what's going from boston back to allentown uh and to see what your return rate is coming out of the northeast uh and it's still at three dollars and 86 cents so you can you know average over four dollars a mile here uh again a lot of uh dense population a lot of traffic and that's why a lot of people want to stay out of these areas uh next and final lane here we're going to run from the midwest into the southeast indianapolis over to uh charlotte north carolina two dollars and 95 cents a mile range 271 to 319 a little bit of volatility not a lot, but still a pretty good rate for a drive-in. And then uh, swap it back over, Charlotte back to Indianapolis. We're still looking at 253 so about a $2.70 average on this lane right here. Thank you so much, Donnie. There's gold and then there are hills, people. So definitely have fun out there on Friday trying to book for the weekend. But that's going to be it for our carrier update. Have a wonderful weekend. But before we go, we're going to toss it over to Isaiah for our social roundabout. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and in this segment, we take a look at what's trending on social media. Well, we've been talking about truck driver appreciation all week, and we're starting to wind things down, but we're not finished just yet. Take a look at what CRST did for their drivers earlier this week. Kona ice on a hot summer day doesn't get better than that. Although we are starting to wind things down with Truck Driver Appreciation Week, we need to show our truckers appreciation throughout the year because without them, we would not have all the goods that are in our homes. So if you see a truck driver out, show them a little extra love. I'm going to switch things up a little bit. We know that Chick-fil-A workers are some of the best fast food workers in the country. They get you your order correct. They get you through the line in a timely manner. And now they're keeping you safe in the parking lot. Take a look at this video.
So a quick little backstory: a woman was getting carjacked in the parking lot. The Chick-fil-A employee rushes over and starts to wrestle that man. And all I can think about when this is going on is, sir, it's my pleasure to put you in a headlock. That's all I have for this edition of Social Roundabout. Now I'm going to toss things over to Bill Priestley for our roundtable. Welcome into the round table. Once again, my name is Bill Priestley, and today we're going to be talking about some rather unfortunate subject for a Friday, though. Those car, car and truck accidents that have resulted in either major uh, uh, illnesses or injuries, and then also possibly fatalities there as well. And what happens in the infrastructure of those trials and lawsuits that come of that? Joining me, uh, we have Brandon Wiseman, the president of TruckSafe, who is also a partner at Childress Law uh, just outside of Indianapolis, and also Matt Leffler, our armchair attorney out of Chicago, Illinois. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Sorry to put a downer on your Friday, uh, but I think this is a subject that we need to talk about more length. We talked a, a little bit with had Clarissa Hawes early on in the show talking about the court case now involving a carrier uh, in which uh, the carrier of the truck was carrying an, an excavator. The excavator hit an overpass and debris coming from that impact hit a car that it unfortunately killed the driver and left a 10-year-old without a mother uh, at that particular point. I don't necessarily want to talk about that case in particular, but just cases in those realms. So, Matt, let me start with you. Uh, if you're a plaintiff, if you're, if you're basically representing a plaintiff in one of these kinds of cases, um, give me a sense of what you're looking for before you even, maybe even before you even take the case in terms of if this happens, when this happens, what are your objectives? Yeah, thank you, Bill. This is a really interesting case. And to kind of talk about high level how we approach these things, this is the everyday life of attorneys. We come in when someone's experienced the worst catastrophic thing that could happen to them. And when you're a plaintiff attorney, the first thing you're looking at is really who died and who was disfigured. That is the very beginning of this calculation of how much something is worth. You would then go to your paralegals and your team and say, I want to know the settlement numbers we've seen over the last year or two for injuries like this. We really understand pretty early on on the plaintiff side how much something might be worth. The next important thing is to get a copy of that police report to understand who was the driver and who was the company that employed them. The number one thing you're going to be talking about after that is who's their insurance provider and contacting that adjuster and finding out out what are the policy limitations? Because if it's a catastrophic accident that involves someone dying, almost every one of these cases will be well over $10 million if they're ultimately found to be liable. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon, let me switch to you on the other side, maybe on the defensive side of things. Let's say you're representing a carrier or perhaps a driver in that sense. Same question. What are you looking for, unfortunately, when this happens? Yeah, first question is, do we even want to be trying this case? I mean, if liability is clear, then the question is, does it make more sense just to settle this case, um, get the plaintiff, whoever's injured in the case, the compensation that they need to make themselves whole as best as we can? Um, that's often the, the very first case. If, if we get past that point and it's clear that we're going to go to litigation, then I'm going to dig in and try and figure out uh, what exactly were the circumstances of this accident? Was there anything that we could have done to prevent this particular accident from occurring? And then the other thing I worry about are these, you know, we hear about these nuclear verdicts that are uh, popping up here and there in, in our industry and have been for several years. And the issue with those types of cases is that they focus less on the circumstances of the accident at hand and more about the motor carrier's reputation, their safety-related reputation. What have they done from a safety perspective to try and prevent these accidents from occurring in the first place? And so that's the questions I'm going to be asking of my client is what policies and procedures do we have in place? Have we had in place to make sure that these accidents don't occur because that kind of informs how we move forward with the case. We're definitely going to get back to that here in just a second here. Um, Matt, let me go back to you. Uh, obviously, uh, in some cases, on the surface at least, seem pretty cut and dried. In other words, there is uh, there, there is evidence to support. There was negligence. There was some sort of, of fault definitely made at certain points. Other times, there's a bit of gray area as to maybe there's a, a not necessarily he said, she said kind of thing, but um, more or less an argument of what the facts are. Uh, with that, what's the burden of proof as you look at a situation that may involve a serious injury or fatality? 
That's a great question. Typically, we're looking at what's called the preponderance of the evidence or more likely than not that someone was at fault. Uh, these kind of cases, there's always a lot of contributing factors that take place. And to Brandon's earlier point, if you're an insurance, if you're a carrier and you have insurance policies and you try to know what the liability might look like, you still have a challenge because your policy limitation, your duty to defend might still be triggered, but you're doing to indemnify. This case might be significantly more than what your insurance policy has. And I will just push back a little bit. Nuclear verdicts is not a legal term. That is not a term that lawyers typically use, generally speaking, because it has to do with a dollar amount over $10 million. And when you have a wrongful death, I mean, even the DOT, the Trans Department of Transportation, puts the human life valuation of about $11.2 million. So all that is to say, uh, these cases, when someone is involved in a, in a death or some catastrophic injury, the liability is substantial, and there might be a lot of different parties you're going to look at to make your plaintiff whole. You can't bring back the dead, but you can try to get the compensation that that plaintiff deserves. Brandon, let me go kind of in the same direction with you. When You've already kind of touched on what you're looking at in terms of what questions you're asking your client. Are you also asking questions about perhaps the plaintiff in terms of their intentions, for, and, I, and I'm necessarily referring perhaps to individuals that – intend to try and get into an, an accident with a truck in order to make a, yeah. a large sum. Yeah, we've seen these cases pop up. It, they, it's widely reported in the last year or so, this case in Louisiana, where um, we have bad actors on the on the plaintiff side of things who, who try and get involved in these accidents with large trucks. Uh, and, and it turns out that there's a whole... Um, there are multiple actors in that process, including lawyers who are who are tied up in that and, and who get prosecuted in it. And so it's certainly something to consider. I don't want to give the impression that it's a widespread issue. It seems mm -hmm. to be kind of an outlier, but it is an issue where where folks will try and uh, just get to the deep pockets, um, whether the the you know whether the accident was you know their fault or not. So something to be concerned with for sure. Matt, because of the uh, Supreme Court, we now have the C.H. Robinson case where now a plaintiff can go after perhaps a broker or a shipper or whoever uh, booked the freight, booked the carrier uh, in and of itself. It, as, as you look at that from a plaintiff standpoint, what's the criteria perhaps going to that level of, of that uh, involving that person in the suit? Absolutely. And I will say the C.H. Robinson case should come as a surprise to no one. Broker liability has been a thing around for a long period of time. But what we got from the Supreme Court was clarity that you're not going to get preempted when you make a claim against a broker. So what will happen is I'm a plaintiff's attorney and I'm trying to figure out how to make my client whole. I'm going to look at the carrier and I'm going to look at that broker. And if you think of a broker, you're going to be absolved from liability. You're wrong. We will sue you. We will go after you. Now, there will be discovery. Maybe you'll do a motion to get out of it by saying, hey, this is the process that we underwent to make sure we verified the carrier. But at the end of the day, that plaintiff, generally speaking, can't take care of themselves. The case we, we looked at to begin with this, this matter shows that they're sometimes not at fault, but they're not going to be made whole because the carrier itself may only have a million dollars of liability insurance. And if the ultimate liability may be $10 million or more, you're going to be looking at ways to find way to help your plaintiff be made whole. And so bro, Brokers could be on the hook probably for a lot more than they realize at this point. Brandon, switching back gears back to you, you talked about you know, having safeguards in place. How can carriers, brokers, shippers be in the best possible situation? And again, it's not a, it's not a if, it's a when this happens. Yeah, so this is the most frustrating thing to me when we talk about accidents like this with our industry. I've been doing safety and compliance work for carriers of all types and sizes for about 15 years now. And the common theme throughout that whole time is how reactive we are as an industry to these types of things. I, uh, that's not universally true, of course, but it is so often the case that motor carriers, you know, th these types of accidents are the elephant in the room. We all know that it's a possibility, but we don't ask ourselves the tough questions of what are we doing to prevent these from occurring in the first place. If we would just take a second uh, and spend the time, spend the effort, spend the money that it takes to get us in a place where we can be proactive about these things. Do we have the right policies in place? Are we properly onboarding our drivers, uh, making sure that they can safely operate the trucks that we're expecting them to operate? Do they have the proper knowledge base about what regulations they are subject to? Do we, as the motor carrier that's employing them, have 
have the right knowledge base? Or if we're a broker or a shipper, do we know what we should be looking for in hiring a safe motor carrier? So I think that's the key is being proactive in, the, in, in these areas as much as we can. Matt, let's get to the moment of truth here. We've got about a two minutes left uh, in the segment here. When it comes down to it, ultimately, we're in the courtroom. What does it take? What is the, the uh, when it comes to who wins and who loses, what do you have to prove as a plaintiff's lawyer? It depends on what you're going for. Typically, what we're looking at is negligence, and negligence has to do with some causation, some duty, and some damages. And what the damages tend to look like is what were your medical bills? What were all of the things that have to go into what you were doing, your, your compensation you were making, your future medical, all of these different things. But what it takes to win in a trial is telling the right story. This is about communication and persuasion. There's a set of facts, and you apply them to the law, and that gives you the outcome that is supposed to happen. Great lawyers will win when they're supposed to win, lose when they're supposed to lose, and occasionally win when they're supposed to lose. These cases, like we see, are typically settled. Uh, the ones that go to trial are the ones where either the there is no defense being actually proffered, or and the other alternative is it's really close on liability, and a carrier decides, I want to run that risk. But at the end of the day, most people know somebody who has been injured or has been involved in an accident that might not have been their fault, and it's much easier to look at a big organization and say they have the insurance, they had the duty to make sure the load was safe, and they failed that duty. And now you're going to be paying a certain amount. Brandon, same question. What does it matter to you in terms of what you have to present as a defense in terms of who wins and who loses? Yeah, I, I guess the question in my mind is, what do we consider winning? I guess the, the position I've always taken with my clients is, if, we've get, if we're getting pulled into one of these lawsuits, we've already lost. By mm -hmm. the time we pay out the attorney fees that we're going to have to pay to defend this case, by the time we, we get all of this negative press for being involved in this accident, we've already lost a big battle. So my strong preference is to stay out of these cases in the first place. And again, the best way to stay out of these cases in the first place is to make sure that you've got the safety and compliance program to to prevent that that's an excellent point there gentlemen thanks so much for joining us i know this is not the greatest topic for a friday but i appreciate your insight and wisdom into it as well thanks for joining us thanks bill thank you all right we'll take a short break we'll come back and wrap up this edition of freight waves now right after this is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app.
Welcome back to Freight Waves Now. It's time for our last check of the weather here for the week. And we're moving back down into the tropical Pacific where we've got our next named storm formed, named, and now moving up the coast. Let's check it out in sonar critical events. As we talked about yesterday, that area that was more to the southeast was going to be the one that was more prone for development. And sure enough, we now have tropical storm Lester hanging off of the coast, uh, really the far southern parts of Mexico, just off of the coast of Central America. Lester looking actually fairly impressive. It's got a pretty well-defined circulation right now, winds at 40 miles an hour. And that area of investigation that was in front of it, 94E, is kind of falling victim to Lester and its uh, development. So we will be watching a little bit more time before we see the impacts of that heading up towards the United States as that area of investigation, 94E, continues to dissipate and starts to kind of fall off. Other good news with what Lester is doing is that we were seeing some potential for tropical development off of the Yucatan Peninsula, some really organized thunderstorms over there moving into the Gulf of Mexico. But because Lester has now formed into that tropical storm and is taking a lot of that energy out of the atmosphere, it's really pulling any of that extra energy that would be needed to turn into our next tropical system in the Gulf and taking it for itself. So those areas of thunderstorms that were off of the coast of the Yucatan, not expected to develop into anything for us here in the Gulf of Mexico. We'll be watching Lester as it has kind of a north northeastward track almost forecast. Should be hugging that coast of Mexico, moving up once again through the Baja California Peninsula and could once again bring some rainfall back into those Southern California areas and the desert Southwest. They saw really record setting rainfall, which came out of the remnants of Hurricane K about a week and a half ago. It'll be interesting, but also needed to get some more rainfall coming out of Leicester. We're gonna keep an eye on that through the weekend, as well as an eye on Tropical Storm Fiona moving out in the Eastern Atlantic. And we'll talk about that coming up next week for your editions of Freight Waves Now. That is it for our weather today. We're going to pass it back on over to Sydney Edwards for our final check of headlines. With the last check of our headlines for the day, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, diesel futures have made a significant downturn in the past few days as demand in the United States weakens, raising inventories. Ultra-low sulfur diesel on the CME Commodity Exchange settled at $3.20 a gallon yesterday, down 17.37 cents from Wednesday, which also had a drop of 16.24 cents. Futures prices are dropping much quicker than declines in the value of crude oil, which has risen to $94.10 a barrel. Wholesale diesel prices have dropped as well, down almost 20 cents just yesterday. And CSX will have a new president and CEO by the end of the month as automotive executive Joseph Heinrich takes over starting September 26th. Current CEO Jim Foote is retiring but will remain on with the railroad as an advisor until March 31st to help with the transition. Heinrichs has served as president of Ford Motor Company, handling its global operations and the Ford Lincoln brands. He said that he has plans to spend time with labor leaders in the railroad to get to know their issues and hopefully find some middle ground with labor negotiations. And Toronto-based GoBolt has announced the launch of a sustainable small parcel delivery service in the United States and Canada, launching EcoCart, completely powered by the company's box night this June, giving them a more diverse small parcel network. So far, the fleet sit at 70 vehicles, but there are plans to expand it to 185 vehicles within the year. GoBalt will offer same and next day shipping, options for contactless driverly delivery, excuse me, and tracking through its truck tracking app. Now you can find these details and so much more at FreightWaves.com and on our FreightWaves app. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. We'll hand this back over to Kaylee Nix and Anthony Smith for the rest of the show. All right, Cindy, thank you for those updates. That does it for us here this morning, but we are not done here today on Freight Waves TV. Lots more content coming up. That's right. We're going to have What the Truck in just about an hour, and we also have Net Zero Carbon making another show. All right, coming on back. Following that, we've got Running on Ice with our very own Sydney Edwards. John Kingston is here for his video edition of Drilling Deep. And you know what? Hold on to your 
advocacy opinions because Cassandra Gaines will take them out of you with Mad Gaines this afternoon Is at 3 o'clock. this afternoon? I think so. Hey, I know where I will be tuning in. That's always going to be entertaining. I think it's going to be between that and with the truck for mm -hmm. the most entertaining out of left field show, but both are going to be a great time. Also, it's going to be a great time. It's going to be F3, so be sure you get your tickets because that's coming up sooner than you might think, and mm -hmm. it's right around the corner. Make sure you get those accommodations set. That future freight festival in Chattanooga, Tennessee in less than six weeks, so get on over. We'd love to host you guys. Come check out our beautiful Chattanooga Aquarium, which, you know, look at this, Anthony. We've got that view right there, downtown Chattanooga. If you come to F3, that could be your view. Yeah, that's the aquarium that really changed this city and mm -hmm. you get to see what it's all about here stick with us next week we'll be right back with more for now